Hi, welcome back to Brain Pods. We are now on, uh, I think, volume 12. We're very near the end. I have with me Dr. Benish, who is uh, new faculty with us, uh, special, specializes in uh, general neurology and in particular headache, which is the reason uh, yeah. why we're bringing you along. Well, thank you. Um, we'll just go ahead and get right into it here. Um, so, uh, headache. Uh, needless to say, uh, super duper common, uh, super duper common in the population, certainly in the population that we see. Yeah. Uh, I The citation I have is number three cause of uh, disability in the young. Have you heard, is that ring true, uh, Dr. Benish? Or? Yeah, WHO statistics say number three. That being said, uh, nearly all are... Uh, benign or do not indicate a serious underlying problem um, and so the question is 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 how do we how do we decide which of those uh, one or two out of a hundred need to be evaluated because if you do miss those one or two out of a hundred you're often missing a pretty serious uh, condition uh, what we're going to go over is uh, uh, both the primary headache syndromes uh, which you have heard of before, but these are the migraines, uh, the tension headaches, the cluster headaches. In addition to that, the secondary headache syndromes, and these, in this group, we tend to get into the far more concerning um, uh, conditions. But we'll go ahead and get started with um, uh, just a little bit on nomenclature. Uh, my understanding, Dr. Benish, is uh, these terms are used in, in clinic, whether or not it's episodic or chronic, and that the distinguishing feature there is whether or not it's essentially uh, half of the month or more. Yeah, and I think the main thing you want to think about is, is the patient suffering more days than not with headache? If they are, it's chronic. If they're not, it's episodic. Got it. Um, here's the clinical conundrum. when If you're working in the emergency department or if you're in a clinic, uh, you recognize that nearly all headaches are benign or primary headache syndromes. Uh, however, you can occasionally stumble into one that is going to be catastrophic if you don't take care of it. And so how does a doctor determine who needs further investigation? And the answer there is a fantastic mnemonic uh, named uh, Snoop. I don't know if it was named after Snoop Dogg, uh, but I find it uh, particularly useful. And I got this uh, from Dr. Taylor, who I have a couple of quotes from which I'll get to a little bit later. Um, but the acronym here uh, is, is uh, SNOOP4. And so these are red flags for headaches, which is uh, if there's a systemic finding, such as fever, weight loss, HIV, pregnancy, uh, and as new neurologic symptoms or sign. Uh, the two O's are if the onset is less than one minute, if, it's old, if an individual is older than 50, or if the pattern has, is new or changed, if it's postural, if it's precipitated by something like a cough or straining, uh, or if there's papilledema. Um, any of these kind of jump out at you, Dr. Benish, as we go through these? No, I think this is good. Under systemic, I've always learned history of cancer goes there. Okay. Uh, so to add that one in. And then on the age, it's greater than 50. And for those people who are taking care of children, it's less than five years old. Okay. You'd add that in. Uh, in addition to that, there's also green flags. So um, this, if you have a couple of green flags, this is a reassuring sign. It's They don't, they don't trump red flags. If you have a red flag, no matter how many green flags you see, you still want to pursue a more aggressive investigation. But if it, a green flag is if it's long-standing, stable, normal neurological examination. There's a family history of similar headaches. And also, interestingly, if they're triggered. If they're triggered by menstrual cycles, order, odors, uh, or food. Yep, and... Go, go ahead. I never, I'm going to uh, take unhook my phone... Sorry about that, everybody. Go ahead, Dr. Bennett. Um, the other thing that's actually reassuring is the episodic. So if they're episodic without progressively getting worse, which you could include under long standing, that's reassuring in and of itself. Great. Thank you. Um, localization. So when patients come in to see us, they often want to tell us where their headache is. Would you agree with that? Correct. 
Uh, however, unlike uh, in other areas of uh, neurology, localization of the pain and the headache syndrome really doesn't help us clinically all that much. Correct. The exception there is if you have a posterior headache in a child, that is really that is quite alarming because that is post the posterior fossa uh, is where kids often get malignancies, and you want to you want to uh, investigate that aggressively. Um, so the only thing I'd yeah. add there yeah. is, you know, unilateral is kind of brings in help with diagnosing Fair headache enough. syndromes, but I'm not sure you would really call that localization. But when the patients are endorsing always one-sided headaches, that often helps. Okay, us. That's, that's, uh, but whether or not it's it's over, whether or not someone says their headache is here versus you know more posterior yeah. or it moves, it starts here and moves over to that side. Those cluster headaches that. Mm -hmm. I, Kind of I've referred to as trigeminal autonomic mm -hmm. cephalalgias, which is a mouthful to say, so we shorten that to TAX, okay. T-A-C. They're usually going to be kind of frontal right by the eye. So that would be the one where you're going to kind of really kind of focus around the eye. And the autonomic, the in the name, the autonomic is very helpful because you get um, you get lacrimation, you get uh, sometimes a Horner's mm -hmm. syndrome. Um, ptosis. Ptosis, sweating, yep. maybe great um, so if you do if you do are if you are snoop positive uh, the investigation is an MRI scan uh, with gadolinium enhancement uh, and if it's for an older patient then uh, add in a uh, set rate uh, of course there's a few uh, situations where you do a lumbar puncture yep. um, but that's that's the, the standard workup when you're snoop positive um, in terms of in terms of a sudden headache of note, uh, that is you don't wait to uh, get an MRI scan. You do an emergent uh, CT scan without uh, contrast uh, to evaluate for hemorrhage. And then even if you if you're still of high clinical suspicion that this uh, could be uh, a subarachnoid hemorrhage, even with a normal CT scan, you would then do uh, a lumbar puncture looking for red blood cells and. Uh, it, when you do a lumbar puncture, you can initially get red blood cells just from the, tra the trauma of the tap, uh, and you can distinguish whether or not it's a traumatic tap or there's really red blood cells in the cerebral spinal fluid if you do not see a substantial change in the number of red blood cells as you go from your first tube to your fourth tube. Um, any other thoughts on lumbar punctures? Only thing is, if you're gonna do a lumbar puncture, take extra fluid and ask them to keep it just because you don't want to repeat your yep. lumbar punctures yep. and always get an opening pressure. Yep. Good point. And of, of and in fact, the, the way they are doing the lumbar puncture yep. right here, you're not able to get an opening pressure. They need to be in a lateral position in order to get a decent opening pressure. You can get in the space this way, but then you need to lay them, lay them over on their side. Most neurologists just do the LPs laterally. Okay. Now let's talk about uh, primary headache syndromes, and we'll start with uh, migraine. So migraine is uh, hands down um, uh, far more common in women than in men, about a three to one ratio. Um, and the, the, the pattern here and the, the clinical syndrome is incredibly helpful, as opposed to necessarily where it's located. Uh, but most migraines are episodic, as Dr. Benish mentioned. Uh, but they're long-standing, they're stable, they often but don't universally have an aura with them. Uh, they, they usually begin unilaterally. Uh, if left untreated, they last somewhere between four hours to two to three days. Uh, and then they, in contrast to other headache syndromes, which we'll get into later, uh, there is often nausea and they'll seek darkness and rest. Um, Dark, quiet room where they don't have to move. No. That's what you're looking for in the history. So Dr. Taylor challenged me, um, who is a local uh, headache specialist who I learned quite a bit about headaches on, uh, about, uh, challenged me a long time ago to think, think about migraine not as a headache syndrome, but instead as, as an underlying pathophysiology. Um, caused by cortical spreading depression, which we'll get into in a, in a moment, which then triggers these 
these this cascade of, uh, of pathophysiology, which ultimately, in many people, leads to pain, but not universally. Um, you can have a lot of um, neurological symptoms and signs from migraine, uh, either in the absence of pain or uh, that precede or antecede the pain itself. Um, and so let's, let's talk about a little bit of, of what happened. So uh, our understanding, my understanding of migraine pathophysiology really starts with this concept of uh, cortical spreading depression. So over your cortex, uh, you have um, almost like a very slow um, ripples from an ink drop, uh, an increase in extracellular potassium, potassium and glutamate. And this spreads as a wave across the cortex quite slowly, only about five millimeters per minute. Uh, and this causes an excitation of cortical neurons followed subsequently by an inhibition. And this explains quite a bit of uh, auras. And I, 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 can, I can describe, I've, I have had, Dr. Yep. Benish, I have had, uh, I, I have had an aura, but I don't. I I have never had uh, the typical unilateral throbbing headache syndrome. It was, it was last summer. I was out jogging on campus and I was volume depleted, and as I was going back into my office, I had a scintillating scotoma across the left side of my visual field, and it was like, oh wow, I'm I'm having an aura right, right. now. And I was I went back to my office, and I was like, well, you know. Here it comes, you know, 20, 30 minutes, yep. I'll get a pain syndrome, but I didn't. Yep. Um, any any, any um, so patient you're, anecdotes you're, yeah. you can share so with us? Yeah, so I actually get rare migraines, typically triggered on a Friday afternoon when I'm looking at an electronic health record and writing <laughs> notes. But um, And so I'll be looking at a computer screen, and it will start. I just have a hard time focusing on the words. Yeah. And then... There's like a little fluttering of the computer screen off in the left upper corner, and then it kind of spreads, and you get a little rainbow kaleidoscope, mm -hmm. and it will kind of work its way across the path of the screen, and then it's done. And then I get a mild headache, which actually, without the aura, I probably wouldn't even yep. notice the headache. And I think that that is often true of patients unless you're kind of suggesting it to them. Mm -hmm. um, so that's true so auras can be really scary to people uh, neurologists who are running and volume depleted get kind of excited like oh my gosh i'm learning about an aura but um to the lay person this is super scary and you can understand sure. how they often end up in the emergency room originally thinking that they're having a stroke so there's a lot of explanation and reassurance but then once that they know this is happening, as long as it's stereotypical, it's really actually a nice warning for a lot of people who do get the headache mm -hmm. afterwards. It usually comes anywhere from 5 to 30 minutes after the aura because they can treat right then and get on top of the headache so they don't yep. get that rip-roaring pain. So it actually works to their advantage in the long run, I think, for treatment. Yep, and then uh, just a little step further, so that cortical spreading depression for Dr. Benish and I almost certainly was primarily localized over the occipital cortex, hence the visual phenomena. Which is the most common. Which is the most common, but you can have a motor effect where people, you know, people end up hemiplegic for a yep. short period of time, which is terrible. And those people almost do universally end up in the emergency department. Yep, hemiplegic, aphasic, other things, yep. Great. Okay. So that, that is, we're starting out thinking about migraine, not as a pain syndrome, but as this cortical spreading depression. And along those lines, you then end up with um, sterile inflammation of the spinal trigeminal nucleus uh, with reactive, reactive oxygen species. Um, and this is where, this is where the pain can set in because the spinal trigeminal nucleus innervates uh, parietal areas of the skull and scalp outside uh, the blood-brain barrier, then activates uh, vaso this, then it can activate vasodilatation. And remember that the only regions um, uh, of the brain the, the, of the brain or around the brain that, that perceive pain are the vasculature and the meninges. Um, and so you, you get a, this combination of vasodilatation followed by uh, vasoconstriction 
um, which is often my understanding of where the pain comes from. And this also explains the throbbing nature of migraines, the way I think about it. Any, any other more sophisticated way to think about it, Dr. Bennett? No, I think that's how I think about it, too. Great, okay. Um, and then, and this is an important concept for all chronic pain syndromes. You end up with both central in the CNS as well as peripheral in the peripheral nerves um, uh, pain, uh, sensitization. So that even though the... The, the initial stimuli has come and passed, you now have continued firing of these pain-related neurons after the stimuli has receded. Uh, and this can lead, in the setting of migraine, this can lead to intolerance of noise and light, uh, but for people whether or not uh, they have other chronic pain syndromes, um, they, will, they will end up with a process called allodynia, which is, which is, a, which is a term I think is useful to know which is pain perception triggered by non-painful stimuli. So you, you touch someone's skin, uh, which is should not be painful, but is perceived as being painful. Yeah. So the most common thing you'll hear from the patient is it hurts to brush their hair mm -hmm. or kind of, uh, especially along the side of the head where the headache was, or the women say, I can't wear a ponytail because mm -hmm. it pulls on the hair. Mm -hmm. Some people say they can't wear a hat, something like that. Uh, this is... Uh, you know, when you when you have a long career dealing with a certain problem, you you tend to develop scripts that you find to be particularly useful, uh, and this is what uh, uh, Dr. Taylor gave to me as some of the specific language he uses to explain migraines to patients. And I think you know, I'll let I'll if if you want, you can go ahead and write that down or or memorize it. Um, but I, I like a couple things what he writes here is that migraine is due to brain sensitivity and handling of various normal sensory experiences differently from those people without migraine. Uh, it often can be triggered uh, by smells, menstrual cycles, um, and, and, it, and again, that re reiterating the idea that this is a uh, dysfunction in terms of how the brain normally handles uh, yeah. pain signals. Do you, have, do you have any uh, ways you like to explain migraine headaches? Yeah, I mean, oftentimes a lot of uh, what I explain to patients is that your brain is more sensitive to changes in routine. So if you get up off your sleep cycle or if you're mm -hmm. dehydrated or you skip a meal, you as a migraine sufferer are more likely to pay for that than someone who's not prone to migraines. And so that all loads into then the loving nagging that I give them to live a nice, <laughs> healthy lifestyle. And the worst people to tell that to are healthcare professionals. So it works for others. Which a lot of neurologists have seem to me have migraine headaches. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so there you go. For those of you who have migraines, you may have a career uh, in neurology awaiting you. Uh, management. So again, uh, think of imaging only if you find something while uh, snooping. Uh, you avoid triggers. Uh, there are acute uh, agents that we use to treat migraine, which we'll get to in a moment. Uh, there are prophylactic agents, uh, and uh, botulinum toxin is used, and even there's there's some other uh, very exciting new therapies on the horizon. But let's talk a little bit about acute medications. This this acts on, as we talked about before, that vasodilatation uh, uh, component of the migraine pathophysiology, uh, because the way I I conceptualize the mechanism of these agents is they essentially stabilize um, uh, the vessels. They are tryptamine based uh, and ultimately are serotonin agonists uh, and as Dr. Benish mentioned they work best if you use them immediately at the onset of the headache. The sooner the better uh, and you can repeat them once. Um, because they are serotonin ag agents uh, do be very careful in patients who are on SSRIs, as a lot of people are, uh, because there is a risk of serotonin syndrome. So I'm yeah. going to just say, please, please. when you're taking your shelf and your board testing, yes, you are concerned about serotonin syndrome, and the pharmacist who gives the prescription to the patient is going to hand them something about serotonin syndrome. It's going to scare them. I am less concerned about <laughs> serotonin syndrome. I prescribe triptans all the time for people on SSRIs. Yep. It is usually if they're on multiple um, high-dose antidepressants and are using something like a 
tramadol. Okay. And then it's the tryptan that puts them over the edge. So I really wouldn't be scared about okay. this as being a provider. I would just mention something to the patient so the pharmacist doesn't scare yeah. uh, the patient away from taking your medicine. Got it. Uh, I don't think we need to go over all of the tryptans. This is the list I came up with. Uh, there is certainly, as time goes by, there's more added to this list all the time. In short, these are all acute agents you give at the onset uh, and then can repeat. Yeah, I think the main thing to remember is some are tablets, some are nasal spray, some are injectable. And mm -hmm. if you're going for fast onset, Mm -hmm. um, you know, injectable is going to be the fastest way to get a medicine in, mm -hmm. followed by nasal spray, followed by these orally disintegrating tablets, and then a tablet. So sometimes it guides your thinking depending on how quick the onset is for the headache. Well, if they have nausea, right? right. I mean, if they have yep. nausea, you, you don't want to give them a tablet. Yep. Um, uh, what, are the, what are the contraindications? So uh, these are vasoactive substances. So if someone has cerebral or uh, cardiovascular disease, cardiac arrhythmias, uh, including Wolf Parkinson White, uh, uncontrolled hypertension, and as we mentioned before, um, SSRIs. Right, and that's uncontrolled. If they just have a diagnosis of hypertension and it's under control, go ahead and order your trip down. Right, we have these are these are pretty common problems, right. and migraine's a common issue, and so we still want to give our patients these op these treatment options. All right, so uh, prophylactic agents. Uh, once you are having, it's eight times a month? Is, was, was that Hotly right? debated, yeah. Okay. So some people say six, but okay. my line in the sand where I tell everyone, no, we now have to have this conversation is eight. So if you're having eight events of these a month, it's probably worthwhile to no longer just take medication right when the pain comes, but instead take a daily medication as a prophylactic agent. This acronym is my acronym uh, from a long time ago. I don't know how useful it is, but A, B, C, D. Um, and this stands for antidepressants, beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, and then Depakote. And Depakote is a stand-in for other anti-seizure medications. Um, and, and my understanding, Dr. Benish, is that these agents all, for the most part, are equally effective. Um, you are, you're targeting, you're considering side effects that all of these agents have, whether or not, you know, someone's an athlete, they don't want to be on a beta blocker, or whether or not someone, um, uh, you know, may be interested in weight loss. Anyway, the, the, the anorexia associated with topiramate may be helpful. Um, how, how do you, I guess, yeah. am, am I missing a couple medications here, and then how do you think about how do you work through this? Right, so you're exactly right. Some preventives work for some people and some won't, and it's trial and error. So you're trying to use the side effects to your advantage, yep. essentially. So under the antidepressants, there's amitriptyline. I use a lot of nortriptyline and then venlafaxine. And I often go for these if people have trouble sleeping because amitriptyline okay. and nortriptyline are great to help sleep. Um, and if there is a more significant depression, then venlafaxine is the treatment of choice because the amitriptyline, nortriptyline doses aren't great mm -hmm. for what we're trying to do with migraine prophylaxis. Um, the beta blockers you would go for if they might have concurrent hypertension or some occasional palpitations, something along that line. They are terrible for athletes. Uh, mm -hmm. because they lock your heart rate in low, right? Yep. So then it's hard to exercise, so you have to screen what they're doing for fun, what do they like to do, because you want these people exercising. Yep. Um, I also avoid beta blockers in people who have uncontrolled depression, because beta blockers can make depression worse. The verapamil is a little unusual. Verapamil does not have solid evidence that it helps for migraine prophylaxis, but we use it all the time. Mm -hmm. In my experience, it works great for people who have frequent auras, and then it's used a lot for those trigeminal autonomic cephalalgias again. But it's always worth a try if you can. And then the Depakote, the valproic acid, I don't go near a woman of childbearing yep. age with yep. that medicine yep. uh, because of risk of birth defects. It makes birth control less effective, so how to stay up late at night worrying about your patients. <laughs> um, 
And it also, it, it increases risk of polycystic ovary disease. It increases risk of osteoporosis. I really try and avoid that. Sure. Uh, I use a lot of topiramate if you've got your Mountain Dew addict who's drinking six to eight cans of Mountain Dew. It makes pop taste gross. Really? Um, yes. And oh. so you're trying to wean away the caffeine. Ha. And so you inspire ha. them to stop Mountain Dew. <laughs> so that's my trick with topiramate. That is fantastic. Um, okay, so let me. I'm gonna. I'm gonna. Um, let me pitch this one over to you, Dr. Benish. I know bot botulinum toxin has been used for a while on migraines. It's a little hard to get your head wrapped around how it works. Other than my guess is that it helps break the peripheral sensitization, as we talked about earlier. Um, botulinum toxin is a uh, works on the. Uh, presynaptic uh, acetylcholine junction and it prevents the release of acetylcholine in the muscles uh, by cleaving uh, the snare proteins uh, and it promotes paralysis and prevents negative food feedback loop. That's, that's my understanding. How do you explain it? Well, so <clears throat> let's just a little history here. The reason why we're using botulinum toxin for migraines is people who were receiving this for cosmetic reasons to get rid of their wrinkles mm -hmm. went back and reported to their plastic surgeons that they had less headaches. And so that prompted the company that makes the botulinum toxin to investigate <laughs> they, this. They, they, they saw dollar signs They there. saw dollar signs. Remember, <laughs> number three, leading cause of disability in the young, which means well-insured. Right. right. Yeah. So they then went back and did the research. So we didn't, we still to this day don't thoroughly know why botulinum toxin works. Certainly there's this prevention of this negative feedback loop, but there have been some more recent studies that in rats with botulinum toxin injections, they can actually see the toxin go travel back into the central nervous system. Oh. And so they think it might have actually an anti-inflammatory effect in oh. that um, uh, trigeminal nucleus we were talking about earlier. So the conversation is to be continued about the exact mechanism, oh. and you can just uh, you know waffle for a little bit if you need to, because uh, I don't think even the greatest headache experts fully yeah. understand why it's working, but it works well. Which is which is a good introduction to all the waffling we do in clinical right. medicine. Um, so next is tension headache. I guess one final thought. Um, there is, um, I, I do know that there's new infusion therapies coming out for yep. migraines. Um, it, it, it might, I, all I know is that uh, a lot of the headache specialists I know are excited about yes. these. Can you describe them a little bit? So they're monoclonal antibody therapies, uh, and they're targeting um, the CGRP peptide, which is the calcitonin Related, gene, probably gene pep reuptake something. peptide, <laughs> their ag, uh, or the receptor for this, and that's mm -hmm. actually the peptide that's involved in this pro-inflammatory cascade that we talked about in the pathophysiology. Okay. And so they're thinking that these are the first medications that have ever been developed specifically for migraine. Everything else has been borrowed. We're borrowing beta blockers and anti-epileptics, etc. So the drug companies, again, saw dollar signs mm -hmm. and have invested a lot of money in these. There are four uh, monoclonal antibodies. Three target the peptide itself. One targets the receptor. They're all in process of development. Uh, two are in front of the FDA right now waiting for mm -hmm. approval. November 2017, New England Journal of Medicine published two articles about two of these agents that <clears throat> were a little lackluster if you're a non-headache specialist. They showed a reduction after three to six months of use of these medicines of, on average, two headache days a month, mm. which is not exciting. I get that. And headache trials are very difficult. And are the, and the, are the infusions <clears throat> continuous infusions? You just no, give it a couple? No, they're actually subcutaneous injections. Oh, okay. Um, once a month okay. or an intramuscular injection, so okay. kind of like a flu shot. Um, but the exciting thing is there are some hyper responders uh, and these are people who went into complete remission of their migraines mm -hmm. by being exposed to this monoclonal antibody. So this is a super exciting time. People are thinking that we could actually kind of put migraines into remission and we've got a fair amount of people who are disabled from their migraines. Oh, yeah. So that's why we're oh, getting yeah. all excited about it. 
Oh, so that's to be right. Continued. To be to be continued. Very exciting. All right, on to uh, tension headaches, um, which the, the, again think pattern when you're talking to someone with um, a migraine. You ask them a few open-ended questions, and in general, they'll describe generalized, non-lateralizing pain. They'll describe a lot of scalp tenderness. Uh, they t they lack an aura because they don't have that spreading the cortical depression we talked about before. And, and, they, and these are non-familial. I mean, it, um, any other thoughts on tension headache? Typically, you hear squeezing, pressure. Those are the terms you hear. And then if you just want to pause on the camera. Oh, yeah, of course. Um, you know, if you picture your netter's anatomy with all those muscles that come up the back mm -hmm. and then kind of come up the front, they're usually kind of describing that squeezing pressure mm -hmm. around here or coming up the back of the head. They tend not to be as severe as migraine either. So yep. they are actually less likely to see neurologists and more likely to see primary care providers. Um, the, in terms of why this happens, uh, uncertain. Uh, again, uh, think uh, central sensitization with any chronic pain problem. Um, I, when, it, when I had a general neurology clinic, I, it, was, it was very difficult to tease these apart from people who had analgesic overuse. Mm -hmm. um, and, 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 and you can have analgesic overuse even with over-the-counter medications, uh, particularly the acetaminophens, caffeine, uh, but also ibuprofen as well. Right. So any use more than two days a week? of short-acting pain medicines, even the over-the-counters, makes neurologists nervous. Right. And you can convert, you know, a, a other headache syndromes, including migraine, to yep. a chronic daily headache with just analgesic overuse. Uh, here is, I'll, I'll leave this up here for a moment, uh, this is Dr. Taylor's advice on how to explain. Tension, as we talked about before, usually well-tolerated and does not cause significant disability. However, if there is a family history um, or if your function is limited, then it might be, it might be worthwhile to think that this might be migraine, even though the, yep. the pattern is otherwise not consistent with that. And the thing there is that when you get into those chronic migraine sufferers where they're having more headache days than not, yep. I find that you end up with this mixed pattern where you sometimes have them endure some tension type headaches and sometimes they're migraine, more migraine like. So they start to merge. Um, I don't have a lot of great insight here on management. Um, uh, Over-the-counter NSAIDs and acetaminophen, but then you know, be careful to avoid overuse. Um, I was I was at the AAN annual uh, fall meeting, and they suggested if you're going to use a prophylactic therapy, recommended tricyclic. Yep. I I've never done that. I did you? Yep. What What is your kind of strategy for tension headache? Yeah. Management? So I I do use the tricyclic if I'm worried about. Um, the analgesic overuse. Um, I'm also very naggy about posture. Um, I think our modern society of iPhones and tablets and as I as I the, have just horrible posture. Right, and I, I, <laughs> I am not a good demonstration. This is a do as I say, not as I do. But you know, all of oh, this yeah. and the computers and the laptops, mm -hmm. it puts a lot of strain. Sure. You've got this eight-pound bowling ball of a head that's now sitting out here and it strains your neck musculature. Yeah. So physical therapy um, can often fix them right up as well. And then all that nice lifestyle behavior stuff as well. Um, moving on to cluster headache. Um, cluster headache is more, unlike migraine, cluster headache is more common in men. Um, and pattern, this is a situation where that severe unilateral headache um, the often autonomic symptoms, lacrimation, tearing, ocular swelling, nasal congestion, um, but the timing is really different from, uh, from migraine. Uh, the, 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 and it's in the name, cluster, yep. right? So they, they do fine for a long period of time, and then they have what seems like daily um, attacks of pain. They last uh, 15 to 180 minutes. Um, severe, they do not seek a quiet room to lie down in. They are very restless. They're agitated. Yeah. The, so they often happen multiple times during the day. 
they are very commonly awakening people at night yep. so if they give you that history yep. that's a big warning sign that it's cluster and these are the people who come to you and they're like it hurts so much that i hit my head against the wall or i i hit myself with my fist because they have to do something about the pain mm. And a lot of them also um, are caffeine addicts because they do find that caffeine helps a little bit. So they'll be carrying their bottle of Mountain Dew and taking slugs here or there. But um, alcohol, tobacco make worse. Yeah, they've got to quit smoking. Yeah. Uh, uncertain thought to be, this is the, the pathophysiology is thought to be related in the hypothalamus. Yep. Main clue there is the autonomic symptoms. Here's Dr. Uh, Taylor's explanation. Um, again, focusing on the pattern, they occur nearly every day for a period of several weeks, then they go away, uh, sometimes up to six months, uh, due to an uncertain brain sensitivity. Um, since these headaches are sensitive to both alcohol and tobacco, it's best to, it's best, best to avoid these. Yep. Um, in terms of treatment, uh, high flow oxygen, and oxygen, you, you can't just use a nasal cannula, you got to put a rebreather mask on them, I think six to eight liters of oxygen. Um, I go 10. 10, okay, yeah. you, you hit them, and wh what's your, you know, what's your anecdotal experience in terms of using that therapy? Uh, oxygen works great. Uh, yeah. Welcome to healthcare. Oxygen is really hard to actually get paid for and approved for ah. this. So I would probably reverse the order. We usually start with the triptans, and it's actually the okay. injectable sumatriptan. Mm -hmm. And again, welcome to healthcare. The problem is the insurance companies want to give these people four injectable sumatriptans a month because that's what they would give migraine sufferers. Oh, okay. So you have to call the insurance or write to the insurance saying, we need probably 24 to 30 injectables available for these patients because they use them that often. So I usually write the triptan prescription, and then start to work on getting them the oxygen at the same time. Wow. Or I, I suppose another strategy would be just to take your four a month, and even when you're not having pain, just keep collecting it. But that's, that's, yes. that's ridiculous. We, we, we advise <laughs> stockpiling. I know you're not supposed to use military, like, you Language. know, but we stockpile our triptans for our cluster headaches, yes. Uh, a pro, any prophylactic therapy. I've, I, I found this, again, uh, listed. I've never used it for as a yeah. prophylactic therapy. So if, they are, if, you, if they just can't shake this, it's usually going to be a month of misery, and then it yeah. goes away. But if it's more than a month of misery, six weeks, you'd start the verapamil to make it less likely to happen. Got it. Okay. And, and lecture them about quitting smoking. Quit smoking. That's the worst. Yeah, no more trips to flavor country. And cigarettes, I believe, cost eight to eight to ten dollars a pack these days. So Oof. you can you can save a lot of money. Yes. Um, secondary headache syndrome. We're going to go over all of these. Some of them we'll go over just briefly. Um, so inevitably, at some point, you will be at a uh, middle school football or soccer <laughs> game, and a child will have a concussion, and because you are the physician there. Uh, <laughs> Whether or not you, you have any experience right. with concussion, um, I, I, there, you'll, you go over concussion at other times during medical school. Um, my takeaway here is just know the resources available to you, with, and you can pull these up on your phone. The current um, assessment tool is the SCAT-3. Um, by the time you run into a concussion, it may be on the SCAT 4. I wouldn't even bother memorizing it, uh, but because it changes every couple years, um, but that's the tool I would advise for evaluating someone with a, a concussion. Yep. Um, more concerning uh, is uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage. And who gets subarachnoid hemorrhages? Um, uh, anyone with hypertension, smoking, uh, uh, alcohol, sympathomimetic drug use, and if, if you know, uh, but if you have a uh, intracranial aneurysm, mm -hmm. uh, which a lot of us, you know, may have several of in our head and we just don't know about it. Um, so, but these are individuals who present with that sudden onset. It's referred, uh, various referred to as thunderclap headache. Yep. Uh, suddenly the worst headache of my life. Peaks within less than one minute. That is, that is a neurological emergency that you don't screw around with. They should get a CT scan immediately, uncontrasted. Uh, and then if, even if the CT scan is normal, uh, do a lumbar puncture looking for red blood cells uh, in the CSF. This is a, 
on the on the right is a, a picture of a subarachnoid hemorrhage. Um, you can see it because it's it's a it's um, filling up the subarachnoid space. The midbrain here is being uh, pushed over to the left side. This is a this is a herniation syndrome. Uh, this individual will will die very quickly if this isn't uh, controlled and the intracranial pressure addressed. Um, the uh, treatment for this is either neurointerventional, and I should include neurosurgical. Um, this is um, both addressing the intracranial pressure, sometimes by doing a hemicraniotomy, um, as well as uh, coiling or clipping the aneurysm. Yeah. This is a medical emergency. You, there is no such thing as a unimportant subarachnoid hemorrhage. Right, and you they they can sometimes be quite small, and they do you know they because they presented acutely, they come in, they otherwise look like they're doing well, and they might just have a little bit of blood in the interpeduncular cistern. Those are still put in the intensive care unit, monitored very closely. Um, as we talked about, so sudden peaking within seconds, with certainly within a minute, uh, they may have nausea, nuchal rigidity, decreased consciousness. Um, moving on to uh, mass lesions, so equally frightening for patients, but very different presentation usually. Um, this can be uh, a malignancy such as an, a, a, a brain tumor, it could be an abscess. Um, but here is, a, here is a truism in neurology, which is that any, any neurological syndrome that is progressing subacutely is something to be very concerned about. Um, so if, if, if they were really doing well a couple months ago and then they started noticing it and it's just getting worse week over week, uh, that, that, that person needs an image uh, right away. Uh, and they'll have, um, I, I guess one, I've, I've always thought when a, when a patient with a neoplasm or an abscess presents with a seizure, it's actually a, 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 good, a good thing because they might, it might have gone missed for several months longer. Mm -hmm. um, um, and the, the, so the, and the treatment for this depends upon what it is. If it's a high-grade malignancy, it's, it's uh, maybe removed, maybe radiation, maybe chemotherapy. If it's, a, it, if it's an abscess, maybe drainage, maybe antibiotic therapy. So this is what every patient who comes to you with new yep. headache is worried about? Yep. Uh, it's actually a very rare cause of headache. Yep. But you have to be aware of when you should be looking for it. Of that one. Oh, and I... I mean, it, in terms of the 98% to 99% of people who have um, what we'll call benign headache syndromes, uh, if they see you in clinic, it is 99% likely to be benign. If it's in the emergency department, it's 98% likely to be benign. So twice as common, but still only one time in 100. Um, low pressure headache, this is a great syndrome to remember because when you see it, it is unmistakable. Um, in particular, this is, so what's happening is, is think about, think about your brain, and as yep. we talked about before, the pain sensors are um, the, around the vasculature mm -hmm. and in the meninges. And your brain is floating in CSF, um, which means that there's no, it's just floating neutrally and it's, 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 um, there isn't any tension upon yep the uh, meninges. However, if for some reason you have a CSF leak and thus there is not an adequate, your, your CSF column is not filled all the way up to the top, think of it like a bathtub that's draining, uh, your brain will literally sag yep. a little bit and it hurts. Yep. And it particularly sags if you are upright. upright. If you are lying down, the column spreads out and, this, and the brain doesn't sag so dramatically. And so what you end up with is this absolutely classical syndrome of the headache gets quite profound if you are sitting up or standing up and it just it just goes it goes away or at least 90% of the pain disappears if you lie down. Yep. Yeah. So when you go out to the waiting room to get your patient or the patient sitting in your exam room, they will be like as horizontal <laughs> as possible while being in a seated position and you're yeah. like, "Hmm, I think I know what I'm dealing with here." Right, and so oftentimes there's a story of they've recently gotten a lumbar yep. puncture. Uh, not universally, though. You can have spontaneous tears uh, just from straining, uh, maybe a whiplash injury, um, a, a coughing episode. Yep. Um, and But you have this story of it is, it is, clearly, it, it is clearly exacerbated 
strikingly. And it's it's not it's not a situation where they sit up and they're like, yeah, it's a little worse. No, no, no. It's it is yeah. it's it's unmistakable. Yeah. Um, okay. So now, <laughs> what do you do? Well, you can you can avoid this in the first place by using a very small gauge LP needle if you do need to do a lumbar puncture in the first place. Um, you can close the leak. So if you if you just envision that you have this leak of CSF fluid usually coming from the lumbar space, you can close the leak with a blood patch. And that's they just do an auto transfusion of a small amount of the patient's own blood, uh, which they usually just get from an antecubital blood draw, and they just uh, inject it. Anesthes we usually have anesthesia do this. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, just in, inject it into the epidural space and all of those wonderful clotting factors um, that are normally activated um, with ex exposing blood to the uh, to the ambient uh, environment they'll act they'll start start clotting and will help seal off the leak. Right. And in fact that blood also just creates an inflammatory reaction okay. so you don't even need to get the blood patch in exactly the right spot the yep. studies show if you put that blood patch anywhere which we refer to as a blind blood patch oftentimes it will help a CSF leak because it's creating inflammation along the dura and closing wherever that leak is so if you have someone and you don't know where the leak is it's still worth trying the blood patch in uh, severe cases, they can do, if there's a big tear, um, neurosurgery can go in and close it or either do a surgical grafting. The worst case I've ever saw of, of this was my neighbor. It was uh, spontaneous, and he, he must have ultimately did about eight blood patches before it finally took. Right. And after, he was a, he's a big guy, he likes to get exercise. I'm talking about you, Dan. Um, I, he's given me permission to talk about this. Uh, but he, he after after doing well with about his fourth blood patch, he was so. And we tell people to take it easy, you right? You have to go on bed rest. You yeah. you have to go on bed. So and he was you know going nuts as people do when mm -hmm. they go on bed rest. And after about two weeks, he then decided he needed to get some exercise. He went and lifted weights. Oh, which is yes, that's, it's yeah. a terrible Damn. idea. Damn. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And. Uh, and he was doing bench presses, and he could feel it tear as he was doing. So any strong Valsalva maneuver will tear right through that yep. again. And I remember seeing him later that day, and I said, you know you're an idiot, right? And he said, yes, I know I'm an idiot. <laughs> yeah, so I saw a young woman, so really skinny young women. She just had a terrible mm. sneezing attack one day, and she felt a pop in between her oh, shoulder God. blades and oh, got a God. spontaneous leak. Oh. Um, but also, if you... People with connective tissue disorders might be slightly at higher risk for having these leaks. So especially if they're having recurrent leaks, sometimes you want to think about screening them for that. With that, you know, are they hyper flexible with their joints or mm. flexicity? Good, good thought. Um, okay, on to a giant cell arteritis. Not something to be missed. This this almost universally occurs in the quite old. We say. Don't think of it after 50 or 60, but I don't know if I've seen it after, except after 70 or 80. Right. It's uh, inflammation of the cranial arteries. Uh, it's more than just the temporal artery, even though we call it temporal arteritis because that's the clue to help us understand what's going on. They present with unilateral temporal pain. Uh, there is, it is quite tender to, palp to palpate the temporal artery. Uh, and then there's uh, jaw and tongue claudication. So the more they chew, the, the more the difficult it, it is, the worse it gets. So they're often misdiagnosed as having PMJ, hmm. right? So joint problems maturing. Uh, there is an emergency complication of this because the arteritis can affect the ophthalmic and retinal arteries. And this can present with an amaurosis fujax type picture of a curtain coming down on the vision. Yep. And I just, it, this wasn't uh, temporal arteritis, but I just saw a patient yesterday who had a, had a history of a amaurosis fujax, and he described it as monocular, and he had, it was like a wall he kept trying to kind of look mm -hmm. around. Um, others will describe it as a curtain coming yeah. down. So curtain across or down. I've taken care of a woman, it was just a central scoto scotoma though. So if you have any vision loss, you are past the medical emergency. If you're thinking to yourself temporal arteritis, 
Right. You have to start the steroids right away and then work on getting the biopsy. Like, do not, there's no dilly dallying with yep. this. Because you can save lives and definitely save and disability and, with this, you know? Yeah. Um, and, and so the, the get steroids going right away. The, bi the trick on doing the biopsy here is if you just take a little bit of the temporal artery, you can miss it. Yep. So you, they take a couple centimeters of yep. the artery, I think. Um, and then finally, you know, trigeminal neuralgia, we put it here even though it may not, you know, I, I don't know anyone who's ever presented with trigeminal neuralgia as a headache, right. saying I have a headache. They say, instead what they say is they have face pain. And what trigeminal neuralgia is, is an irritation of the trigeminal ganglia, usually thought to be secondary to vascular compression. The superior cerebellar artery is right around that um, location. And if it compresses a branch of the trigeminal ganglion, usually V2, which is the mandibular branch, you get this sudden unilateral yeah. lancinating pain. It obeys the peripheral territory. Mm -hmm. It is, I mean, you, you, you can't, yeah. it, it, it's bad, it comes on suddenly, they describe it as lightning-like pain. Um, you, you, can, you can try to avoid triggers, uh, but it can come on. Right. They're the people yeah. who talk like this. Yeah. They do not want to move their face because it just hurts. Yeah. Or if they're, they're not going to wash their face, men shaving, that can trigger it. Um, brushing their teeth. Yeah. Wind, wind blowing wind, on yep. it, brushing hair. Changes, like all in the shower, things. the water on the face. It is it is very distressing. Um, a management. Uh, this management really hasn't changed much since I was a resident. I don't know if it, we've said use carbamazepine or oxcarbamazepine. Um, here at the university, uh, Dr. Stephen Haynes and uh, has really. Um, been a leader in the field on vascular decompression, which my understanding is it is it works pretty well in some cases and others not. I, they're still trying to figure out who is the best patient for this. Um, other thoughts on, on on what you do with patients yeah, like this? Yeah, you can throw in gabapentin or sure. pregabalin into the medication trial. Sometimes we'll do carbamazepine and you just can't get the dose high enough, so you add on a gabapentin in addition. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the surgical candidates who do the best I, right now are people who are more episodic. And if they have like a residual underlying all the time pain, it's considered atypical and they tend to do less well with surgery. But Prob I usually let the neurosurgeons decide who's a yeah. candidate. Probably along those lines of, again, central sensitization, right? Once you, with, you know, the... And that's that's true of a lot of pain syndromes. So zoster. So people after have yeah. zoster. If you have if you have zoster, which is shingles, which is a reactivation of the varicella um, virus in the dorsal root ganglia, that is quite painful. The the great concern is that you don't let that become a chronic pain problem even after the zoster goes away, uh, but because you want to treat that pain as a you know as aggressively as possible. Usually not with opioids, but usually with um, uh, the pregabalin, gab uh, the, the alpha-2 delta ligands, the gabapentin and the pregabalin, uh, mainly because you help prevent that mm -hmm. um, central sensitization. So we're coming to you from the future, either for yourself personally, family member, or your patient. Get them, get them taken care of as soon as possible. And if you have someone over the age of 65 who's a loved one, tell them to get the new shingles vaccine. There you go. It's very effective. Uh, just expl explanation on trigeminal neuralgia to patients, um, nerve in your face, um, it's in contact with a blood vessel that irritates it, um, and it causes the, the, the nerve to respond, to produce pain. Um, I, I don't have much else to add on trigeminal neuralgia. No, I think no. that's good. Great. Well, thank you, Dr. Uh, Benish, quite a bit. Next on Brain Pods is your final volume. Uh, we're just going to do an introduction to uh, pediatric neurology, and we're looking for a very, very special guest with that. So thank you, Dr. Benish. You're welcome. Thank Hopefully you. you'll be seeing uh, many of our students. So. in. Uh, tell them where they will run into you. Uh, I'm at the CSC for my uh, clinic. And, do, and you do do some inpatient, general inpatient neurology work? Yeah, I'll do work. some inpatient rotation work. Great. Okay. Thank, thank you very you. much.